Hello, everyone. This is Justin Grammons, the host of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Thanks so much for listening today. Just dropping in here before this episode starts to let you know about our first ever full day long conference on applied artificial intelligence and machine learning. It's going to happen on Friday, November 4th. It will be in person in St. Paul, Minnesota. And how can you register for this event? We'll go to AppliedAIConf.com. And for being a loyal podcast listener, just use the discount code of podcast to receive a 50% off discount on your ticket purchase. So again, it's Friday, November 4th in St. Paul, Minnesota. The Applied Artificial Intelligence Conference will be talking about all about artificial intelligence, machine learning, applications to our world, a great networking opportunity. We've got a full range of speakers talking about all sorts of different applications in a wide variety of industries. So look forward to seeing you there Friday, November 4th. Check it out at AppliedAIConf.com and use the discount code of podcast. So thanks so much, all, and on with the next episode. AI is not a magic box that you just going to plug in a, in a wall and that's it. It will answer all your life question. I, I see it a lot in chatbot use cases. I'm always, uh, uh, you know, I have always an alarm when a customer is looking for a chatbot because I make sure that they understand the maturity of a chatbot today in the market. So with that, we can manage their expectations. Welcome to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast, where Justin Grammons and the team at Emerging Technologies North talk with experts in the fields of artificial intelligence and deep learning. In each episode, we cut through the hype and dive into how these technologies are being applied to real-world problems today. We hope that you find this episode educational and applicable to your industry and connect with us to learn more about our organization at AppliedAI.mn. Enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. Today, we're talking with Yon Zamar and Mohamed Sabri. Yons is a head of product at Wallaroo, an enterprise platform for production AI. As a product leader, he is responsible for vision, strategy, and roadmap, as well as building product teams that use qualitative and quantitative data to deliver effective product designs and experiences. Mohamed Sabri is the founder of Rocket Science and the MLOps Institute, where he is developing the next generation of MLOps engineers. He is a data science mentor at MIT and wrote a book on data science essentials called Data Science Pocket Guide. You can find his book on Amazon. So thank you, Yons and Mohamed, for being on the program today. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Excellent, guys. Well, great. So having you both on the show here is, is a treat as you both you know, live in this world of ML ops. And we haven't really delved in super deep on this program with regards to sort of like what that means. Super excited for our listeners to, to really get a glimpse into two awesome companies that are doing work in the space today. And so, you know, maybe Jones, I'll ask you to go first. Maybe you could give us a short background in terms of the trajectory of your career and maybe how you got into ML ops and what Wallaroo does. Absolutely. So I started my career in, in software engineer and transitioned to product management somewhat by accident. Really, the, the type of companies that I've worked for have always had this focus on data analytics and therefore machine learning was a natural graduation of, of working on analytics. And really throughout my career, I've seen instances where we had to work on experiments, be able to get to insights from data. But really what got me into MLOps was the helping to deliver that last mile on those insights to be able to operationalize the machine learning or the, or the data science for the lack of a better word, to produce AI that drives an outcome. So I, I discovered that when I was working at ClearCover Insurance, when we had some you know, retention issues and I was able to basically build a team there to help deliver our first you know, ML models in production that helped drive the, the retention from there. Yeah, it was really our first, you know, my first exposure to it and a lot of learnings from that that I was able to take with me to my next adventures with Tempest Labs and also right now with uh, Wallaroo. Awesome. Was MLOps known as a, a word or a thing in this space at that time? I would say a couple of years ago, it was not well known. It was more understood as, you know, this discipline that takes machine learning and puts it in production. So it, it's still, even though the word exists and, you know, it's talked about, I think the understanding around it, it's still evolving depending on the maturity of the of the, the businesses using it and at what stage you are with your AI initiatives, for the lack of a better word. So if you're still building experimental AI, yeah, you, you have some MLOps. If you're building industrial industrialized AI, your MLOps practices should be very well advanced. So yeah, it's still evolving. That's probably my my take on it. 
That's great. That's great. I'd love to get more into industrialized AI and sort of like what that means. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll delve into that. Mohammed, do you want to maybe take a shot here? Talk a little bit maybe about your background, how you got to where you're at today and, and what, what rocket science does? Sure. I started my career as a more into data analysis. Worked the majority of the, my career as a consultant or freelance. Been a lead data science for a, a couple of years, uh, leading a practice of data scientists and, and data engineers. And a year and a half ago, almost, I started Rocket Science, which is a company that develops solutions in uh, the field of machine operation. Today, we do mainly services. So we help company build their own enterprise MLOps environments. What get me into MLOps is actually three years and a half, maybe four years ago. I had customers when I was developing machine learning models for them. They were asking me, hey, Mohammed. Can you deploy those models? Can you put in place everything we can to potentially manage the life cycle? And I'm always like open to learn new things. So I was like, yeah, why not? Did it <laughs> once, then second time, then third time. I was like, yeah, that's pretty much an interesting field. Why not build in an expertise in that? And that's how I started like having a focus in, in machine and in operation. And as a field, it keeps gaining traction, the more AI gain traction. And today there is a need for ML ops as a lot of data science machinery solution. They have delays to go in production or they don't even go in production. And sometimes the reason is related to how companies manage the life cycle of their machinery models. Gotcha. So there's some sort of, like you say, they're, they're, they have models that are deployed. But what you're focusing on is making sure those things are up to date and they're continually being retrained. Yeah, sometimes they don't. And sometimes there are delays. I mean, uh, based on the statistics, this is a couple of years statistic, but I think in some companies it take up to nine months. So the models Mm. are live in production, not just not to develop them, but more to put them in production. And that's a problem because it shouldn't take long, that long to start having value over your machinery models. Oh, for sure. That's like many decades in the software world, I guess, right? It's just, you can't, you can't be waiting that long. At Rocket Science, do you guys have your own proprietary solution that you use or you kind of use what the client wants to use and sort of stitch together using, using off-the-shelf tools? We started this year developing our own technology. We got granted by the Canadian government, like we got grants for uh, developing an innovative solution in, in the field to support what we do in services. But today, so far, we use customer technology. We're quite agnostic. So, man, multi-cloud. I mean, we had project on GCP, Azure, but as well AWS. So, yeah, that's pretty much the landscape. Nice. Yeah, that, that's that's good. That's what that's what we find at my company is just a lot of companies, they have built a lot of infrastructure in place and they're, they're not ready to pick up things and sort of move. So, we're pretty flexible that way. At Wallaroo, you guys, you guys have your own platform, though. Is that is that true, Jons? That's right. So yeah. we're we're specialized in what we call the last mile of ML. We're we're a true ML ops platform focused on basically the deployment, management, observability, and optimization of models in the context of production. This means that as a company, you might have reached your what we call time to insight, as in you have developed a model, and your model is ready to be operationalized and integrated with the, the downstream systems or operations that will be consuming it to produce that value that or that ROI on your investment in machine learning. That's where we come in actually and help with that operationalization of, of machine learning. So the idea is that we support not just the, you know, getting into production, but helping you scale and helping giving you all the tools to be able to understand what's going on in real time, be able to take the necessary, you know, proactive you know, preventative and corrective actions on your models as, as they start drifting, as they start presenting anomalies, as, as, you know, they start presenting bias. All these things happen when you put your model in production. So the idea is to try to get ahead of it as much as possible and be able to take the necessary actions. That's really the fun of, as I mentioned, operationalized ML is you get to start seeing, you know, what the model is, is doing because when you move from a fixed training set to a production set with you know, volatile data, you start seeing some weird things and that's where you get to learn the most uh, as, as a data scientist. You, you learn a lot in production. So this is somewhat not what's happening with, with software engineering because when you go to production, you have ironed out all the kinks and you know exactly what's happening. 
because you're somewhat working with metadata. It's set in ML and modeling, it's data. So unless you can control the data, which is not the case today, you have to have the proper monitoring techniques and, and, the, and the ability to basically react to it or even proactively anticipate where, you know, what your data is going to do to your business through the ML debt that is, you know, consuming it. So you're able to course correct as needed. That's the biggest blind spot in, in ML apps right now. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask, what are the problems? I mean, one was speed, basically, or, or time to deploy your model. That sounds like that's a huge pain point with, the, with your customers that both you guys are working with. What are some other pain points, I guess, that you feel like you're coming in to solve? And I'll open that up to either one of you if you want to share. Yeah, I can actually start on, on the pain points. You said it very well. The speed to uh, deployment is, is certainly a challenge. It's challenging, operationally speaking, and technologically, also because some of the technologies that are out there they have been somewhat repurposed to do deployment of machine learning that was basically reusing things that were done for deploying software and regular applications. So that's that's challenging because you're talking to a different set of users. Now you're talking to ML engineers, you're talking to data scientists. Do they fully understand those tools? Not always. So there is certainly a, a user friction that, that comes there, which, you know, slows things down. But also, yeah, just the overall you know, cultural shift that now it's everyone can train models, but does everyone have the ability to know exactly how to get value out of them? So, so that's why the, the challenges that would make deploying slower. And there are a lot of technologies there. A lot of companies are, are certainly starting to figure out ways to speed up deployments. You can hear about deployments in minutes, you know, deployments in seconds, like, like Wallaroo, but it's only the beginning of the journey. It's truly the, just your, it's just the tip of the iceberg. From there, how do you know that you have deployed your best model? And when you figure it out for one or two or three models, does it scale to 1000? When you're basically your entire, you know, as we go back to industrialized AI, if your entire operation is running on machine learning, then we're talking thousands of models that are running. How do you actually make sure that you're not burdened by, by the scale of what you're doing? How repeatable is it when you start going from five models to 20 to 50 to 1000. So that's, that's really the other challenge is the repeatability of it. And then the, the last one, which is the blind spot I mentioned, which is the ability to observe and take action on those models as they start drifting, as data trends change, as we start seeing, again, some weird results, like what happened with some credit card applications that were getting denied for, you know, specific bias and uh, over the attributes that they were looking at. So those are the things that today are still, you know, not fully supported or well thought through. So it's, it's certainly being able to understand exactly what's happening and get ahead of it is really the, the, the other big challenge when you have models operating in production. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think maybe people wouldn't even realize that you might have hundreds of models running in production. That, that to me sounds like a, a very, very uh, difficult problem to solve. One other challenge I'm going to bring up is the, the cost of running all of this. It, it gets really expensive. We talk about GPUs and CPUs and, you know, all the infrastructure that you need to, to run this. Being able to run this at scale with, with optimized infrastructure is something that, you know, it's another challenge because, yeah, there's a lot of unplanned expenditures that comes, that comes with that. As you scale, you have to make sure that your cloud bill is not blowing up, for lack of a better word there. That's the other challenge that most companies at scale try to get ahead of. From my end, what I see a lot as a change in ML ops is related to the underestimation of the effort like that is needed in a machine learning operation. I mean, a lot of companies, they visualize when they start doing AI and ML that all what they need is a bunch of data scientists and it should be just fine and they'll find a tool somewhere maybe at a certain moment to support them. And then they realize actually that they need proper infrastructure, they need proper pipelines, they need access to data. And so that underestimation is not good because it's hard after to manage people's expectation. And it might make them, in, put them in a situation where they're just like, hey, it's just too much. I think that's one of the problems. So that's why I spend a lot of time doing education around why is it important to have an MLOps practice in the data, pra in the AI practice. Another challenge, which is more a tech practical challenge, is related to data availability and access to data. 
There are two things that we spend time doing in services a lot. It's either the CI, CD, or the, the making data available, like building up data pipelines, because data is needed during the development of the models, but it's needed as well in production. So those are basically uh, the type of, of challenges we see in ML ops. In terms of AI in general, I think one of the problems that we face, uh, there are two problems that I see here right now that I'm thinking. The first one is managing people expectation. You know, uh, AI is not a magic box that you just going to plug in a, in a wall and that's it. It will answer all your life question. And I see it a lot in chatbot use cases. I have always an alarm when a customer is looking for a chatbot because I make sure that they understand the maturity of a chatbot today in the market. So with that, we can manage their expectation. The second thing regarding AI is more the adoption, like Younes was saying, which is important because the adoption from an end user perspective is actually critical. If you develop an amazing solution that is deployed and everything, and it is done to be used by users inside the company. If they don't decide to change their processes and they keep doing the thing, their old habit and old ways, and they don't use your tool, so your tool becomes not much useful and you know you don't create really value. So sparing always time for helping the adoption and make sure that the end user are using the solution, I think it's important. And the adoption in terms of mindset at a management or executive level. So the data, everything data related and AI related becomes a priority for the company. Those are the different challenges that I will be, that I can see right now. Those are great examples. Yeah, for sure. I think with any technology, there's always an overpromise. There are at least people that don't understand it well enough. They think they can use it across the board and use it on anything. The world of a consultant, I think, in some ways is just resetting expectations, as you were saying. It makes a lot of sense, especially as you go into these organizations and they're trying to adopt AI for maybe the first time. Yep. You mentioned credit card examples, I guess. What, are there any other types of applications that either of you guys are sort of working on where you, you see it being used in sort of a unique and different way? Or maybe even just any way, I guess. Yeah, in terms of use cases, there's a wide range of AI applications, so you can you can look at it today. You know the most popular ones are, you know, when you look at e-commerce, for example, build in optimized top of funnel for your recommendations and targeted based on attributes that are driving your your bottom line, which is retention conversion. There's a lot of applications there where you you, you start having like better recommendations, not not random experiments. They're all targeted. And then obviously any recommendations as, you know, you start shopping for your products, when you get, you know, you, you go to walmart.com, for example, a lot of the recommendations that you see there, they're certainly AI enabled. So that's a common application when it comes to banking. Fraud detection is one of the common, one of the most common use cases they're using AI. When you run a credit card transaction, you can predict if it's going to be fraudulent and therefore based on that prediction, you know which action to take. The system will know which action to take. I think one of the most interesting use cases now that we're starting to see start to go towards manufacturing, IoT, where you start having these, you know, smart machines, smart devices that are actually, they have these lightweight ML models that are actually deployed inside the machine and they're able to essentially consume the, the, the data in real time and be able to somewhat dictate the behavior of the machine or the device based on the data that they're consuming and, and the output that the model is producing. So we're starting to see that in, in telecom and even like consumer products and CPG with, you know, smart razors, smart toothbrushes, things predicting if, if someone is going to get a cavity from their, from their toothbrush. So there's a lot of fun use cases that are making our lives better. And obviously going back to my previous experience at Tempest where now AI is also being leveraged to, to help basically come up with novel therapies for cancer or heart disease. Those are really the things where we're starting to harness now the power of, you know, clinical data, genomic data to be able to come up with these powerful models that can help physicians and clinicians recommend the best therapy for, for a patient, especially when you talk about a disease like cancer that is very personal. You can get the same diagnosis, but the human genome is, is crazy. So you have to know for a personal disease like that, how to basically 
know what to target and, and what, to, what to recommend from the therapeutic standpoint to be able to come up with the, the best decision and recommendation. So a lot of applications there. Can, we can be here for hours, name and done. So <laughs> how do people get start on, started on Wallroad? Do you guys have like a freemium model or you know, if somebody has an application that they want to bring in? Yes. So we do have actually two offerings. We have the enterprise offering that basically our enterprise customers are using at scale, but we also have the community offering that is launching with general availability on June 27th. So that's, that's a freemium offering that anyone can actually go and download. It can be installed on the three major clouds and people can actually start playing with it to see how you can deploy, manage, and observe your models in, in, in your own pseudo production environment to basically understand the the simplicity and how easy it is to take your models to production. That's really the thing that we're vouching for is, is yeah, machine learning is hard. Deploying the models doesn't have to be. So that's, gotcha. that's, really, that's really the, the motto. That's great. That's great. And yeah, yeah, I, I, I will be sure to have liner notes and all sorts of links off to both your guys' website and your platform and, and all that stuff to share with, with our listeners here, all the amazing stuff you guys are doing. Mohammed, I did mention in the intro that, you know, you're an ambassador to MLOps Institute and also working at MIT as a data science mentor. I, I teach here at a local university in Minnesota in the graduate programs. I teach an IoT and machine learning course. So it's, it's funny when you were talking about, you know, sort of IoT and, and, and ML, kind of this area of tiny ML. That's kind of like this new term that everyone's using. What sort of got you into that? It's, it sounds like you're very interested, Mohammed, in sort of training people in this, in, in this space. What are, what, what are you seeing, I guess, with regards to trends, new students coming out, people that you're working with, and sort of like the next generation of, of AI expertise? I train postgraduate, so it's usually professionals that are looking for a certification and deep dive in ML and data science. A lot of curiosity, I think, and people sometimes underestimate the effort. They always complain that the material is dense, but it's a dense program. And they usually work and they study as well. So uh, they ask me, Mohammed, I probably already forgot what we did in week one. I usually tell them, look, the best thing you can do is just practice. Everything anyway in life is about, especially in a career, is about practicing. I told them anyway, what we've seen, if you don't practice it in the next six months, you know, you're just going to vaguely remember what it is and what we did. So it's just about having like practical work done and practice as much as you can. But a lot of interest anyway for a career switch in data science. You know, we created MLOps Institute, so it will be training with as well, um, studying a certification over 12 weeks, but really dedicated to machine learning operation, which is not yet popular, but our bet is that it will become a popular job. So we're trying to build partnership with universities here in Canada and in the U.S. So sometimes, you know, again, when you speak to people that are not familiar with the industry, they're like ML, MLOps, pretty much the same thing, but it's definitely not. I mean, it's a thing to know how to develop a model. It's another thing to manage the life cycle and be able to deploy models and be able to automate over the existing pipelines and life cycles. So yeah, but teaching is always good. I feel I'm bringing value. I look at the statistic because at the program I teach, they, com they compile the statistics for us. I think I impacted over the, since the beginning, which is over the last year and so, a hundred learner, which is good. A hundred learners that I know will be using what I was teaching them uh, practically in their companies or their personal project, which is good. Yeah, when you teach, you have to be patient too, because if you think that it's simple, don't expect the other to absorb it as if it was simple and a lot of repeating. I, I have to repeat myself sometimes, but that's fine. It's a part of the job, I think. Yeah, it's one of the, it's one of my weaknesses actually is that I lack patient. So when people actually ask me ML, MLOps, AI, my answer is, you know, MLOps is how you turn your ML into AI. If you want to learn more, go talk to Mohammed. Uh, <laughs> I like that. How you turn your ML into AI. I think you're onto something there, Mohammed. I guess, with regards to like, you know, just viewing this as a skill set that everyone's going to need to learn. I, I think about DevOps. I feel like maybe DevOps is further along in the curve. But, you know, as you start deploying software to the cloud, there's a whole bunch of infrastructure that needs to happen. And there's a number of different people that come together to build a software product. 
cloud enabled product, everything from product management. I mean, I think you guys know that, you know, and of course, you know, software engineers and app developers and QA and, and then system administrators. I mean, just everything that I think of when I, from the early days of the internet, building the software. Now it needs to be operationalized. And so I, I feel like maybe machine learning is still in this infancy, but it's definitely going to be something that more and more companies are going to need to hire for. Yep. It's going through the same revolution that DevOps went through with the emergence of the cloud. It's really the same thing that happened with software development is now happening with machine learning. We're in the early stages. We're, we're starting to see it. Yeah. How big is are both your guys' companies? My side, I'm around like 10 people today. And we are about 40 people projecting to be around 50 sometime this year. Nice. Nice. Okay. Well, cool. Well, what's, what's a day in the life, I guess, of, of you guys? Busy. Uh, busy. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Are you, are you down in the code, Mohammed, most of the time? Are you programming a lot or are you trying to run the organization at a strategic level? I, I help the programming team. I don't necessarily have the time anymore to program anything. Because I'm trying to have best practices in my team in terms of engineering development and so. So sometimes I usually follow up with what everybody's doing. I like doing debugging. I'm the chief debugging officer. So in <laughs> case something's wrong, I usually have a 40 minute, 45 minute call with the engineer and try to fix, fix the, 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 the code problem. So yeah, but mainly running the, running the company, doing conferences, meeting with customers, doing strategy and uh, managing the team. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. For me, it's basically from shaping the vision and the strategy of the company and the product to basically sometimes really being, being in a Jupyter notebook, testing the, you know, the Waller SDK. Because, you know, we were a product led organization. So the product is our asset. So we're all empowered to, to know how it works and, and basically provide feedback on it. And not just, you know, the, the engineers building it, but also the customer teams, the, the product teams, the sales teams. So yeah, it's, it's really a wild rodeo and, and a wide range of activities for one day, but it's a lot of fun. That's what comes with, you know working for a Series A startup, but it's, it's rewarding. It's high risk, but also high reward. That's great. My organization here, we have about 25 people. I really like sort of small boutique shops, right? That's kind of like what we do. I think we're pr probably similar to you, Mohammed, in that, yeah, we help companies use AI, but also we build a lot of software, mobile applications, you know, cloud apps. But it's fun to be small and nimble, I feel like, because then you can actually get a chance to wear a lot of different hats. You're not really pigeonholed into a specific thing. And so, you know, being in a fast paced startup product company, like, like you are at Walru, that, that sounds super exciting. And, but then also being able to, uh, work with a small team and solve problems for customers like you're doing Mohammed, that sounds awesome too, as well. How would you advise either of you guys advise somebody to get into the space? Say I'm a recent college graduate, just coming out of school here. Where are some things or some resources that either of you would suggest, whether it be, I don't know, people on Twitter, obviously there's a book, Mohammed, that you wrote, you know, as well. But yeah, we're, we're, I guess I, either you could sort of like jump in and answer the question first, but where do you suggest people start? I think that's Mohammed's favorite question. So you will have All right. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> I think whatever path you take, the most important thing is practical experience. So get the job at a certain moment in the field, because that's the hardest part, especially not, not in all the, the path, but at the beginning, Getting in the field, getting your first experience is harder just because what, what is happening today in the, in the hiring market is that it's like a pyramid where because it gained popularity, there are so many new entry level junior people that want to apply versus very few senior just because it's a field that gained a lot of popularity in the last 10 years. And uh, from an author perspective, the pyramid is reversed, meaning that the companies, they tend to look more for senior people, even if they are, of course, entry level and junior position in data science or even ML or ML ops. It's just that companies are more craving for intermediate seniority. To a certain extent, that would, that even impacted the number of years required in average to call someone senior in the field. So yeah, that's basically the, the, the market situation, meaning that the person should try to learn 
either from the internet or either through internships or through certifications and then do whatever he can or she can to get a job right away. Because that moment when you start looking for a job and you get one, you're going to fight for it. You know, you're going to struggle and it's hard. It's very competitive. So, and after when you start having experience in the field, it's very easy to switch, you know, because you get contacted, people, they want to hire you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But getting the first experience is always the hardest. Yeah, from my perspective, because I work in product and this field has notoriously been very technical, machine learning, AI, data science, it's, it has been somewhat exclusively technical and focused on developing models, mining data. It could be sometimes intimidating to people in product as they might feel like they're not needed because they come in, they work with data scientists and engineers who are extremely talented experts in the field. And they get the illusion sometimes that they're not needed in this field. But one thing I'm actually participating in a, in a program right now called um, Illuminate AI, which focuses on a lot of topics, but my topic is around product and AI. How can you become a product manager or a product professional in AI? The one advice that I'm, that I'm giving there is you don't need to be an expert data scientist or an expert in machine learning to be able to, to get into the field. All you need to be is really be curious about, about the field and understand the impact that AI can, can make. And also, as you understand the life cycles and the stages that data goes through from being just, you know, from its raw form all the way to being, you know, artificial intelligence. If you understand that life cycle, you'll be able to understand exactly who gets involved when and, and what they were doing. And at that point, what you end up focusing on is really the tail end, which is you build AI enabled products and you focus on delivering the best experience to users using those products, or you focus on building products that help streamline the process of developing and operationalizing AI. Like, you know, myself, for example, I'm working on building a product that streamlines operationalizing AI and machine learning. So my goal is focusing on assuming I don't understand anything, I can still go and define a good product experience that a data scientist or a machine learning engineer would benefit from just by listening to them. And that's really the, the other trait that I would recommend looking for if you're hiring for a product role in AI is, you know, be curious, be open-minded, try to listen to your audience. You're, you're building a product for the user, not for yourself. And it doesn't matter what, what background you have. You can be from marketing, from business, from engineering. If you have those traits and, and you're, you know, willing to understand the pain points and, and uh, you know, the, the outcomes that you're driving, you will be very successful in this field. It doesn't have to be any different from building an e-commerce platform or mobile app or, or anything. It's, you know, and you're still solving a user problem at the end of the day. That's awesome. No, I love that. I love that. And I love you said you don't need to be an expert because I think, I think none of us are. That's what's so cool, I think, about this whole field and new technology that's in this emerging space is, is everyone's picking it up. And at some point, all of us were picking up that you know, a book on machine learning. But at the end of the day, we're just experimenting, I think, around. And that's why I started this podcast, really, was to just talk to people and learn. <laughs> and I've been having a ball doing it. And so I'm by no means an expert in any of this stuff. So it's really good to have that open mindset as you come in and tackle these problems. I agree. How, how do people reach out to you, uh, Yunus and Mohammed? Is it just on LinkedIn or? Yeah, I think LinkedIn is cool or email as well. That's usually the way I communicate. I have only two channels. Same here. LinkedIn, primarily. You can reach out to me directly. You can follow me. You can, you know, send me a connection request. Cool. Well, I'll be sure to put your LinkedIn profiles then as, as links for people to reach out. Is there any other, I guess, you know, areas of ML ops, I guess, that maybe I didn't touch on that you guys wanted to, to share as well? Not necessary. I mean, there are a lot of things to say, but I think we covered some of the interesting aspect, like the challenges and so on how to build a career and, and, and so in the field, which is pretty interesting. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else on my end. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, I appreciate your time for both you guys. I think it was really interesting to hear uh, sort of a, a product side and then probably an entrepreneur startup services business side of it. And, uh, you know, it would be awesome to come back, I think, in, a, in another 12 months maybe and, and see how the field has evolved and changed. But I think it's a, it's a growing area and I think it's a growing pain point that more and more businesses 
probably haven't really thought through. Everyone says, oh, it's great. I have this model. I've, I've, you know, I've, I've, I've run this Jupyter notebook, right? I have some data. Now I have a model that's, that's there. So basically just push a button and now it's in production, right? It's like, no, you know, there's, there's a lot of components and a lot of things I think around business process that need to be factored in. And then everything around how to reach, like retrain that model in the future. Do either of you guys work with any, th- any stuff uh, just before we like close out here? I mean, there's, there's a lot of, sometimes there's a human in the loop, you know, aspect to some of these things. I think that some companies need to delve into. Either of you guys, you know, had to, had to work with companies and, and sort of bring that capability into situations? In, in what context exactly, just to make sure I understand? Yeah, well, I was just thinking about models that drift, right, for example. And, and so some of them could basically be drifted because you don't have enough data, but you also maybe need some human, some human characteristics. I guess some additional tagging of features, you know, so this is, this is more something that actually needs to be a supervised learning model. But you might need to deploy, a company might need to deploy X number of people, workers in some ways to actually update the model. So, you know, how does that factor in to the entire process of, of as you're building out the operations? Yeah, that is actually the, one of the main things we, we strive for. And, and we, at least at Wallow, when we talk about model monitoring and model observability as you scale, does it mean that you have to scale the team with it and the number of workers that will have to, to actually be involved? To catch things. So the, the short answer is no. If you have a thousand models, doesn't mean you don't need a team of 500 data scientists. But there are some, some techniques that, that are out there where you can actually put in the, the necessary validation checks in the, in the product. And, and you know, as a data scientist, you're, you're the one who's intimately familiar with the models. You know exactly where the, where the holes are and you check for those. You're, the definition of drift is, and from my perspective, up to the data scientists to, to define. And there's just one, one side of the equation. The other side of the equation is really the business analytics. So the two will have to come together and, and be able to work together. The data scientists can see that sometimes the model is not doing anything wrong, but the business is still not reaching the, uh, the, the metrics or the objectives that it, that it set out to achieve via that investment in AI. So that's, those are the, the, the gaps by essentially having the ability to quickly translate model insights into business insights will certainly help alleviate a lot of concerns and, and bring in the, the other side of the business being, you know, the business analysts or, you know, the business intelligence side into understanding directly what's happening with, with AI when it's, you know, running in production or ML when it's running in production, be able to, to take action or at least correlate the insights from machine learning to business metrics. So that's, that's really the, one of the challenges that every company today would be talking about primarily because again, the field is new and this notion of model monitoring is still a blind spot and monitoring models, models, as I mentioned, is the starting point. Understanding the impact on the business is really where it's at. So there's, there's a lot to unpack. There are a lot to do. (laughs) For sure. For sure. Well, excellent, guys. I appreciate your time today. And yeah, look forward to keeping in touch, Yunus and Mohammed, in the future. And best of luck to both of you and your, your organizations. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having us. You've listened to another episode of the Conversations on Applied AI podcast. We hope you are eager to learn more about applying artificial intelligence and deep learning within your organization. You can visit us at AppliedAI.mn to keep up to date on our events and connect with our amazing community. Please don't hesitate to reach out to Justin at AppliedAI.mn if you are interested in participating in a future episode. Thank you for listening.